Um, my name's Stuart. Um, for, for those who don't know me, I'm one of the key leaders here this morning. We're going to continue um, looking at our series this morning um, in the book of Luke, where we're looking at Jesus. Uh, we're going to be looking at how, how we individually, corporately following Jesus. And as I kind of got to thinking about this a few weeks ago, and I looked at it, and then I delved a little bit deeper this week, I realized this is... This is not going to be nice, neat, and tidy. Uh, this is guaranteed not to be nice, neat, and tidy. Because um, following Jesus is not nice, neat, and tidy. And it will push our boundaries. It will push us to the boundaries. Jesus, because Jesus spent his life with the marginalized. With marginalized women, voiceless children, tax collectors, those with all sorts of... Um, Things going wrong in their lives, the poor, the forgotten, the excluded, the oppressed, those in need of physical healing. That's who Jesus hung out with. And from that point, he started a movement. Some people would call that a revolution. But he started a movement. The Bishop of Burnley... um, is called Philip North. He's not a re- relative of mine. Apparently, I don't think he is, anyway. And he once wrote this. He said, Renewal will come from the margins and from the broken, abandoned places that people want to forget. As I scour through the pages of church history, I cannot find a single renewal movement that hasn't begun amongst the poor. There simply isn't one. Look at St. Francis back in the 11th century. Look at the Acts of the Apostles. Where did they begin? Look at Wesley. Look at Newman. They went to the forgotten, marginalized areas. And that challenges me to reflect on the past, to learn from history, but to pray, God, what do you want to do in this generation? And before we kind of delve into, if you want to find in your Bibles, Luke chapter 6, it will appear on the screen in a few minutes. But we're going to dip into this chapter and see, we see a familiar context that Jesus is speaking into, that he's um, ministering into. And because the context is Jesus has been out on a mountainside all night, hanging out with his dad, hanging out with his father, being recharged, renewed, a place where, um, in verse 12 of Luke 6, it says he spent the whole night praying. Not many of us do that. But when that's kind of documented in the Bible, you know something critical is going to happen. Something transformational is going to happen. In this case, it was Jesus who uh, was kind of choosing his 12 apostles, so it's this close group of friends that he's going to invest in over the next few years, that he's going to invest because... He knows that they're going to be the ones who are going to multiply everything that he is doing across the globe. They're going to be multiplying that kingdom vision that Jesus is inputting into the world, teaching and modeling them. That's why he spent all night praying. We don't just do past nights of prayer or prayer weeks or times where we kind of intentionally um, pray just for the sake of that seems a good idea because we're desperate to see something critical happen in our church, in our lives. So let's read from Luke chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 17 onwards. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how your ancestors treated you, the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who will laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. 
Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. It's, for me, as I've delved in, it's kind of a passage just full of contradictions. Not quite adds up in my head. So what is it that Jesus is trying to communicate? He's trying to communicate that the place of blessing is firstly a level playing field. I found this picture, and it kind of looks a bit like some of the pictures that my son Dan plays on on Saturday morning. There's nothing level about those pictures. But in this situation, Jesus went, he, he newly appointed apostles, his new team, other disciples, and they found a level place, a gathering place. It is a physical description here, but actually the reality is that Jesus wants to view us all on a level playing field. People came from huge distances. They came from the, the, the cities of Tyre and Sidon, those um, non-Jewish cities. So it wasn't just Jews, it was those who were non-Jewish. People were, were desperate because something was happening. Now to me, I think of that, I picture that whole situation as I read that, and it sounds really intense. You know, hundreds, maybe thousands of people you know, you just see one miracle happen. You can imagine the intensity, the conversations, the what's going on. But if you see healing after healing, everyone that touched him, there must have been a really kind of, whoa, what is happening here? The power of God is breaking out. Yet Jesus is saying, this is a level playing field for all. And he creates an atmosphere that is a radical welcome. It is as we kind of shared in, in church a few years ago, our vision was about it being extravagantly generous. Jesus didn't turn anyone away. Most of those situations were really challenging for us. And I would say in our culture, we don't get what that means to have that level playing field where we have a radical welcome, because we're quite controlling. We are quite controlling, even of our welcome of others. We have generosity with limits. We've learnt what the art of self-protection is. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but we've kind of made that our default, rather than something of a welcome that Jesus demonstrates here to hundreds of people, but he also did it one-on-one. -on -one. And I find that already a challenge. How do we create an environment where Jesus can minister to the the most vulnerable in society, in our churches, in our communities. That's, what Jesus, that's the environment that Jesus spoke into. He interrupts the healing service with a Bible study. And there's an expect, expectation that God's going to break through. Now, I'd suggest that cultures around the world are a lot better than this, than we are. They understand what it means to have a radical welcome to say, okay, anybody's welcome. Life is a little bit messy. Whereas here in the, in the Western world, in the UK, we don't get that. There's a guy called Shane Claiborne. He's a writer, speaker. And he quotes an Iraqi um, bishop who told him that Christianity wasn't discovered in the West. It was domesticated there. Now that's quite close to the bone and quite uncomfortable, if we're honest. In 1 John verse chapter 3, this is what radical welcome is. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The Father demonstrates, Father God demonstrates what radical welcome is, what a level playing field is, because he lavishes love upon us. That place, that environment, is a place of belonging before belief. It was a buzz phrase a few years ago to say that. But that's what that environment is. It's about building community that is, is relational, that is invitational, that is listening. Whereas where we build community here is not like that in our society. Because we have this thing called power. 
It's not the power that we read about here that is oozing out of Jesus. It's a power that is destructive. We see it in politics. We see it in leadership. We see it in all types of relationships. Yet Jesus is saying, this is a level playing field where his power is life-giving and life-changing. I'm talking about some quite uncomfortable things, maybe. But I want to encourage us to ask ourselves questions. What does that look like for me in my everyday? How do I deal with my internal judgments, let alone what comes out with my mouth and how I live my life? There is no easy answers. I'm saying it in the mirror to myself. I'm not saying it, I'm standing here, I'm really not saying that. But I know for God's power to break out in our community, in our lives, we have to find what the level playing field is. But that place of blessing, where Jesus is blessing, is also an upside down thing. Jesus interrupts this environment of acceptance, of expectation. He looks at his disciples, all the other onlookers, and then he speaks into their lives. And this, this kind of little bit around the, the blessed bits is, is the recorded teaching of Jesus that is really similar to in Matthew 5. And some scholars say it's the same. It's the same situation. Some say it's not. Some say it's a sermon on the mount. Some say it's a sermon on the plain. Nobody's totally decided what is this. But actually, whether it is the same situation or not, and it doesn't matter if Jesus repeats himself anyway, does it? He kind of does that quite a bit because we're a bit slow to get on. But actually, um, in this situation, he's saying that the kingdom of God is upside down to what the world is saying. And he's speaking that into that Jewish culture, but the same message is speaking into our culture. Following Jesus is about these values. Jesus is, is equipping his new disciples because they've got to pass this on. But this agenda that he's preaching is totally different to what they are thinking that the Messiah, Jesus, is all about. They're thinking Jesus is about... Uh, you know, it's about political or material blessings, about kind of making it and changing the whole society. Yet Jesus is turning on its head an upside down kingdom that he's bringing in. It sounds to me that we need to hear this again in the UK, particularly at the moment. In our messy society, in our inward looking, our self protectiveness, our non-welcome attitudes, whether we admit it or not. It's a call for us as Christians to live out an upside-down kingdom, to ask God to break through supernaturally in our society. That's why we have prayer weeks. We are intentional about saying, God, break through. So I'm just going to briefly go through these blessed bits. And give us a glimpse of what does Jesus mean? What does it mean to live in an upside-down kingdom? Jesus promised blessing to his disciples. That Greek word for blessed means happy, but it's, it's an inter- internal deep happiness, not something that is a sense of me merely feeling a bit comfortable or I'm happy because I'm entertained. But it's a deep internal happiness. So when he says, Bless, you are blessed by being poor, that's bonkers. Yeah? That doesn't make sense to me. Yet the power and the wisdom in this truth lies in the fact that the poor person must look to others for, for what they need. In our self-reliance culture, that speaks masses. We were designed, I've spoken about it before, we've spoken about it, we're designed for community. We cannot be self-reliant on just me. Here in the UK, we are an island, and we think like an island. But Jesus is saying, you need to be able to look to others. The poor get it. I think if you, um, the, particularly the materially poor get it, if you come along tomorrow evening and hear Esther share about some of the people that she's met in India, you will hear something of what it means to be materially poor 
get to be blessed, to be happy. And we don't quite get that in the same way here. We have poverty in the UK, but it's not on the quite the same scale. In the parallel passage in Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. That broadens it wider. That means it's all of us. Our reliance is not on ourselves. The preacher writer, old guy, Charles Spurgeon, said this, Not what I have, but what I have not, is the first point of contact between my soul and God. What I, not what I have, but what I have not, is the first point of contact between my soul and God. Jesus is saying, actually, it's not about being self-reliant on ourselves. He goes on to say, blessed are you who are hungry, who hunger now. The hungry person seeks. They look out for food. If I'm hungry, I gradually move to hungry. And I'm slightly miserable if I don't <laughs> eat and both. I'm annoying to live with. Their hunger, a hungry person, has a drive in them. They look for food. They look for something to satisfy appetite. It gives them a single focus. That's probably why Jesus encouraged us to fast, because it gives us a single focus to look to him, say, God, I want to see breakthrough, so I fast. Blessed are you who weep now, both individually but in society. It could be grief, it could be loss, it could be repentance for sin, it could be millions of reasons. But Jesus points to not just to the weeping, but points to an extreme reaction, an extreme response, that weeping should be replaced with laughter. That's just like two ends of the scale to me. That's upside down kingdom vision. Someone here needs to hear this. Psalm 30, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Someone here needs to hear that today. That's what it means. That's what Jesus is speaking about. Blessed are you who weep, because joy is coming. Joy is coming in the morning. Then it says, blessed are you when people hate you when they exclude you, insult you, reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. It seems impossible that all those people, whether you're, um, whether you're poor, whether you're hungry, whether you're weeping, that people also hate you. you can't, I can't get my head around that. It seems impossible that people but would be hated, but they are. Those who follow Jesus are hated and rejected. And then it says, as a response, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. That is a paradox, a contradiction, whatever phrase you want to use, that is confusing. But we don't get that very well here in the UK. We go, hmm. But around the world, Christians get that far better than we do. I was looking, trying to find a a succinct little video clip to show someone telling their story. I couldn't find one that was, but if you want to go and see testimonies of people around the world who know what it means to be persecuted, go onto the Open Doors website or YouTube channel. There's millions of people telling their story. And I found it interesting that on Tuesday, last week, you know, when the country was waiting, debating, bored silly, <laughs> of his chaotic mess around Brexit. We watched it unfold on our screens, on our social media feeds, all wondering what happened. And whatever happens, it will have an impact on all of us, but it will have an impact on the poor more than anybody. We need to pray for that. Yet, in another part of the House of the Parliament, Open Doors is one of the main charities that supports the persecuted church around the world, was releasing its World Watch List for 2019. Its annual ranking of the 50 countries where Christians face the most persecution. 
And I read this from their press release. This research shows that Asia is the new hotbed of persecution, Christian, persecution for Christians. Persecution in Asia has risen sharply over the last five years, with one in three Asian Christians now suffering high levels of persecution. That's been just. Five years ago, only North Korea was in the extreme category for level of persecution suffered by Christians. This year, there are 11 countries. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Sudan, Eritrea, Yemen, Iran, India, and Syria. This charity open doors. The, mon- the experts are monitoring the situation in 150 countries. And it's become so so much worse that countries need 21% more points to make it into the, this top 50 than they did in just four years ago. And the shocking statistic is 4,305 Christians that we know of were killed simply because of their beliefs in 2018. The church around the globe gets what persecution is like. They get what it means to be blessed of the poor and the hungry far more than we do in our comfortable living here. But in those, all of those countries, the church is growing. There are stories after stories of people of what it's like to have nothing, but their faith in Jesus is growing. Maybe they're away from the trappings and the securities of wealth or food, of comfort. They know what it means to be blessed. To have that internal happiness. I was listening to a, a, a clip um, of a lady in North Korea. Well, she's been kind of traveling around the UK at the moment for the last few years, just telling her story of how she started a church in a toilet in um, one of the labor camps. That's, that's somebody who understands what it means to be blessed. And I find that challenging because with all these kind of contradictions of poverty and hunger and weeping and being hated, what does it look like to live in this upside down kingdom here in the UK? That's my challenge. I'm not going to give an an answer for it, because I don't have an answer. But that's our challenge for us individually. It's not an empire building thing. It's not relying on our intellect or our material possessions. It's about saying, God, I want you to break through. During this week, just locally, I heard a a story of a child in a local school who wasn't eating, wouldn't eat their free school meal, and took that meal home for his family. That's just locally. I heard of um, an ex-offender who was struggling hugely since being released, was supported by... Um, some mentors that S has been equipping, a volunteer who at the right moment, with words of, and offers of encouragement, particularly through practical ways, saw this person's life change around. This person was going to do something on a particular day, but someone stepped in and offered encouragement in practical ways that changed the course of that journey of that person's life. If Jesus says live that way, then how do we do that? Because the challenge to me is the woes at the end of this passage. And they're not they're not a threat, they're just expressions of regret. Jesus contrasted the expectations of what the people listening were thinking the kingdom of God was going to look like. He mocks the world's values. He bigs up the wor- that what the world despises, even now, and he rejects what the world admires. That's upside-down kingdom living. And I'm going to finish in a, in a moment with just a few quick questions that I want us just to pause. Because this is not a very comfortable thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not comfortable to say it. <laughs> How do we treat others? In our own congregation? In our communities? 
What does it look like to live upside down kingdom and on a level playing field in Bristol? What does it look like to show a radical welcome and extravagant generosity? And are we prepared to say to God, change me today? I don't know what that looks like for us in the vision. I'm not even going to say what it looks like this. But are we prepared to God to say, change me today? Because I recognize a little bit of this in my head and how I view the world, my world view.